What are they going to make of you after you die? You may be familiar with this exercise where you're asked to imagine your own funeral. Who's there? What are they saying? Is it something about your work ethic? You were a family man, a great mom, you were funny. How many people even bothered to come to your funeral? It can be a sobering exercise. And of course, it's a version of the old stoic practice of memento mori, remembering that you are mortal. It focuses you. What does your life stand for? Well, you wonder what Pyrrhus and Marius thought if they did this exercise. And don't you think that men like that did imagine what their funerals would be like? After the death of King Pyrrhus of Epirus, his friends built a great funeral pyre, and they cremated his remains, according to the custom of their country. And it is said that, after the fire did its work, they found, as they were looking among the ashes, that the great toe of his right foot had a divine virtue, so that after the rest of his body had been consumed, this was found to be untouched and unharmed by the fire. What kind of leader do you have to be for your body to become so charged with divine energy that part of it endures beyond the normal limits? Or at least that people believe and circulate those kind of stories about you and your appendages after you die. Conversely, a few years after Marius' death, when Sulla took over the city of Rome after a great civil war, Sulla had Marius' remains dug up and thrown into the Tiber River. So what kind of leader provokes that sort of response? Welcome to the Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman heroes in order to sharpen ourselves for the present. We take Plutarch as our guide. This is the comparison of Pyrrhus and Marius. Now that we're at this point of evaluating these lives, I'm going to ask you a favor. I'd love to hear from you and get your feedback about these biographies. What did you like? What stood out? Or where did you get lost or even bored? What did you want more of or less of? Who should I do next? Write to me at alex at ancientlifecoach.com. It always brightens my day to hear from listeners. Now for the comparison. First of all, I want to take a moment to remember, why do we compare these Greeks and Romans to each other? Is this worthwhile? Well, Plutarch did it, and we are following in his footsteps, but why did Plutarch do it? I have three points to make here. Number one, Plutarch was both a Greek and a Roman. This is just obvious, but it's true. That was one of his motivations. He wanted to help two distinct cultures see themselves in each other. Number two, Plutarch thought the qualities that make a good leader transcend cultural and situational differences. And so to compare leaders from different cultures, different periods of history, helps us to focus on what is shared, universal, and timeless. Number three, comparing two different role models helps us practice comparing ourselves to these role models. And, you know, we can do that, comparing ourselves to these role models in an insecure way. Of course, we can swing from an inferiority complex to delusions of grandeur. But that's not the goal. We want to be more rational about comparing characters, more philosophical. But I think even above that, what Plutarch is tapping into with these biographies is captured by the Greek word zelos, which is positive emulation. It's actually where we get the word zeal. So here's a line you could put on a poster of a guy climbing a mountain and uh, stick it on your wall in your office. Zeal is the act of comparing ourselves to others in a way that motivates us to try harder. You know, we admire the virtues and successes, analyze the failures and avoid the vices. That's zeal. Okay. For the majority of Plutarch's pairs of Greeks and Romans, there is a comparison essay that still exists that Plutarch wrote. But for Pyrrhus and Marius, there isn't one. He leaves it implicit, therefore. He leaves us to ask, first of all, what benefit did he imagine that there would be for us as the readers to read these two biographies together in the first place? And on this point, you can point to many facts that Pyrrhus and Marius shared in common, they both had mentors who helped them on their rise to power that they later turned against. Pyrrhus with his older brother-in-law, Demetrius, Marius with the Metelli. Both men were famous commanders, hugely popular with the troops, 
and known for personally taking risks on the field of battle. But the main thing that Plutarch seems to have in mind in comparing Pyrrhus and Marius next to each other is a study in the pathologies of ambition. Whereas with Sertorius and Eumenes, we saw men channeling their ambition to causes that were clearly greater than themselves, it's much more questionable whether Pyrrhus and Marius succeeded in doing that. Was it about something more than the great man being great with these guys? Pyrrhus's ambition problem for Plutarch was that as soon as he achieved anything, he traded away consolidating that single victory, securing those gains, and opted instead for the riskier prospect of doubling those gains. And for this reason, his rival Antigonus Gonatas likened Pyrrhus to a board game player who makes many good rolls of the dice but doesn't know how to use them. Pyrrhus humbled the Romans in southern Italy. He was wildly popular. If he chose, he could have gone around and united the Greeks of Tarentum, Locri, and other small states. He could have forged a more powerful alliance with the local Italian tribes. They could have trained up a stronger army, fortified the countryside better, maybe integrated that territory into a broader empire of Epirus. Been a match for the Romans. But the work left to be done there was political, not military, and Pyrrhus wasn't motivated by it. Or at least, he couldn't resist the temptation of pressing on to intervene in Sicily, where he had a greater upside. It seemed like it would be easy. And he did get pretty far, almost cleared the Carthaginians from the island, but he was undermined by the reluctance of his Sicilian allies. They didn't want to fully support the war effort in manning a massive fleet to blockade the impregnable fortress at Lilibaeum. And yet they wouldn't let him declare victory without totally clearing the island of Carthaginians. Again, effectively it was a political failure, a challenge of persuading allies to accept an unsatisfying decision, whether to pitch in or accept a second-best sort of a victory. And this challenge of persuasion was one that Pyrrhus just wasn't up to. Have you ever been tempted to pause a project that's three-quarters done in order to take on a second commitment that you think will be many times as rewarding for just the amount of effort that it would take to finish the first? Well, then you know a little bit of what Pyrrhus was feeling, maybe. And it's not like we usually walk away from things when they're partially done thinking that we're actually abandoning them. Oh, this assignment is practically going to finish itself now. I can start on this new thing, right? Well, Pyrrhus rationalized Sicily as an extension of the Italian project. There were certainly some logical leaps there. But an even prior leadership question is this. Was Pyrrhus even entering a situation where success was possible? And how could he know? How could an Epirot mountain man really be fit to assess the risks of an expedition to conquer a great foreign island with a highly decentralized set of rival cities? If nothing else, perhaps we could say that he failed to finish his due diligence before committing all of his resources. And after Sicily went off the rails for Pyrrhus, he abandoned it, and he came back to Italy to polish off that mostly done Roman project, to find that it had gotten much more difficult in his absence. It's good to take risks, but sometimes the desire to win big gains blinds us to the magnitude of those risks. If anything, as Plutarch points out, Pyrrhus's greatest stumbling block was his cousin Alexander the Great. Pyrrhus had many opportunities to scale back his adventuring and settle into being a happy king of a prosperous kingdom, but he couldn't resist the idea of pushing on to conquest after conquest, like Alexander had shown the world it was theoretically possible to do. And you know, he may well have been just as talented and warlike a general as Alexander. But talent alone is simply not the only author of our destiny. We have to have the cooperation of fate, of the gods, of circumstance. Alexander had Philip's army, his dad's army, he was fighting the Persians, a kingdom that had grown old and sclerotic. And there was a centuries-old story that cast this as a battle between East versus West, tyranny versus liberty, and so on. There was a big idea that he could use to motivate recalcitrant allies. Pyrrhus surged into a much different world in the West. 
Pyrrhus refused to accept his lot, to see the limits of the opportunities he was faced with. He just kept on pushing his luck until it ran out. And I know that there are some of you who will write back and say something like, well, didn't he win undying glory for going down like a fiery meteor instead of cooling off and joining the asteroid belt? But then, even if glory were a man's worthiest goal, could he not have won greater glory for himself by founding a more stable dynasty, by raising up strong children? Epirus was taken over by its neighbors later in the 3rd century, some two generations after Pyrrhus. What if he had called it good when he captured the Macedonian throne from Antigonus after his abortive Italian mission? What if he had turned down the rebel Spartan Cleonymus in that daring and unjust power grab? What if he had declined to go adventuring in yet another land in Sparta where affairs are such that he only marginally understood them? Maybe Pyrrhus could have turned Ambracia into a center of art and learning, something like Alexandria became in Egypt around this time. Maybe his children could have allied with Hannibal and together they could have toppled the Romans, and so on and so on. In other words, if you're going to ask, say, well, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, would they have been so famous if they hadn't died young? Well, that's a cheap way of glorifying a tragic death, isn't it? It's one thing to give your life young for a worthy cause, and another to cast it away through reckless adventuring. And please note, I mean no shade on those fine musicians. I'm only talking about Pyrrhus here. But if I'm honest, his death pains me, even now. It's noble to rage against the dying of the light, but it can be exceedingly difficult, even for far-seeing people, to discern whether our boldest efforts are well-spent or wasted. In Pyrrhus' case, however, a simple calculation of justice might have kept him clear of the final Peloponnesian mess he got himself into, kept the old widow's tile from his head. He shouldn't have even been there. And as for Marius and his ambition, well, here's a question for you. If you start a bar fight by throwing a punch, and the other guy pulls out a gun and starts shooting at you, could you argue that it's justified for you to pull yours in response? But maybe it would be better to just be more careful with your punches. Before we leap to judgment, though, put yourself in Marius's position for a moment. In his comparisons, Plutarch likes to look at the different circumstances each subject had, what he calls his fortune or fate. And Marius wasn't born into the royal family like Pyrrhus. He had to claw his way out of obscurity in a much larger and more established system. The Roman Republic was getting on fine without Marius. Everything about the system was telling him, the kind of help you want to offer is not really needed, young man. Rome needs soldiers, not leaders. Rome has plenty of leaders. He might have interpreted all that, all the barriers of class and family and wealth, as fate as his lot in life, that he should just settle for some kind of junior officership, be a centurion or something, and then when he got old, he'd be some obscure but modestly wealthy equestrian businessman type. But it was ambition that told him otherwise, that he could be better than all of them. From since he was a young man, ambition was what trained him to advance in that system by finding ways to break with convention while respecting the letter of the law. His challenge as tribune against Metellus, his election as consul, it was legal. He respected the laws while disrespecting the nobility, the traditional upholders of the system, the status quo. Ambition drove him to seize the generalship against Jugurtha from Metellus in a very unconventional, but nonetheless arguably legal way by forcing a plebiscite on the matter. How many times did he have to ignore the voices of the senators or the voices inside his own head that were telling him that he should just accept his lot in life? He had to seize success from the clutches of fate as much as from the unwilling hands of the nobility. This is often what unusual success requires, isn't it? Continuing to strive long past the point where a more mild-mannered person might 
just give up out of sheer embarrassment. There can be a certain selective shamelessness to ambition, that transgressiveness that somehow works for us. And that's how his fateful attempt to take the generalship of the war against Mithridates from Sulla, it fits into a pattern that Marius had built his success on. It was a bad idea. He was an old man by then. Sulla at that point had a much stronger popular mandate than Metellus had in the war with Jugurtha. Sulla had just been elected consul. He had had the most brilliant record of military success in recent years. Marius had already had his turn. Marius should not have thrown the first punch. But how do we guard against such an error if we've achieved some measure of success? One way is to surround ourselves with good and wise people who will speak honestly with us and challenge us. And this gets harder with time as we get older, doesn't it? For many reasons. We're less inclined to listen. Perhaps we're more entrenched at the top of command structures or hierarchies of honor. Marius grew increasingly isolated from his peers in the Senate. Many of them had simply died off by that point, but he had alienated many of the living ones too. What would they have told him if he were there to listen? Marius, this is immoderate, excessive, unjust, foolhardy, contrary to nature even. But they weren't there. He was surrounded by junior protégés of his and flatterers egging him on. And one thing our sources don't talk about in all this is the Italian equestrian businessmen in Marius' circle who were probably putting a lot of pressure on him. Marius, if that conservative Senator Sulla fights this war, it's not going to be good for Roman business in Asia. It's not going to be good for the Italians. Marius, we supported you then. We support you now. You owe us this. You can imagine how those conversations went. The relationships we make or that we let fall by the wayside, they can determine our path in life. We can paint ourselves into a corner where it becomes impossible to do the right thing, the wise thing, without letting everyone down. A good friend, a friend of good character, will support us when we make that kind of tough decision like Marius should have made. Don't sign the deal. Don't publish the document. Or maybe go and speak out against the popular opinion. A good friend will stand firm when everyone else falls away. They'll want to help us to make the right choice. Or maybe sometime it will be our lot to be that good friend to someone in such a circumstance, to advocate for the choice with courage, restraint, wisdom, and justice on its side, to avert disaster. But they may not listen. Pyrrhus's friend Canaeus certainly tried, as the story goes. Marius and Pyrrhus were both fortunate enough to have great and noble accomplishments to their names as leaders already before they took the steps in their life that tarnished their legacy. Some of Pyrrhus' followers, it seems, kept his big toe as a sort of holy relic. Imagine that. Marius' relics were, of course, dumped into the river. But he had his grateful fans in the next generation, Cicero and Caesar and Augustus among them. He had a statue made of him. But how many more leaders of similar ambition and transgressiveness, never got that far, never got that lucky. What were their funerals like? Reach out to a worthy friend today. If none come to mind, well, you know what work you have to do. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. Till next time, this is Alex Petkus.